Deities and Demigods from TSR was released in 1980, the final core book of the AD&D game. It provided a resource for a variety of mythological pantheons so that players and dungeon masters could integrate deities into their character backgrounds and campaigns and also as a major resource for cleric characters. However, the inclusion of some fantasy fiction, the Cthulhu mythos, Malnabonian mythos, and the Nuon mythos had stirred a bit of controversy and propelled this supplement into a legendary status of its own. This week, I'll peel back the cover on this classic AD&D book and attempt to dispel many of the rumors and find the truth of the matter, as well as take a deep dive into this classic AD&D supplement coming right up on RPG Retro Reviews. Hello everyone, I'm Captain Courageous and I review old school modules and games and try to give them a fun and informative analysis. This week I'm turning my Wayback Machine to 1980 to discuss the release of the Deities and Demigods supplement from TSR. Considered by Gary Gygax to be the final core rulebook in the AD&D game, this book added a major component to the rules and was meant to help Dungeon Masters run these divine beings and to classify their abilities. Written by TSR Luminaries Jim Ward and Rob Kuntz, the initial release covered 17 different mythological pantheons, everything from the Greek, Babylonian, Egyptian, and Celtic mythos to works from fiction such as the Arthurian heroes drawn from Sir Thomas Mallory's La Morte de Arthur in 2 H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythos. There was also the Melnibonian mythos from Michael Moorcock's Elric series and the Nuon mythos from Fitz Liber's Favard and the Grey Mauser stories. The origin of the book stems back to the very beginning of the D&D game with the original Dungeons and Dragons supplement Gods, Demigods, and Heroes, the fourth and final supplement for the original D&D game, which included Robert E. Howard's Hyborian Myths, which not only included stats for Howard's titular hero Conan the Barbarian, but Conan's god Krom and other gods of that pantheon, as well as a healthy list of Hyborian magic items. The next section included the Melnibone myths, game stats for Elric, the sword Stormbringer, and the deities in that pantheon. Thus, Gary Gygax considered deities and demigods the final part of the AD&D game, and he stated so in his Sorcerer's Scroll article in Dragon Magazine number 14 when he wrote, AD&D will consist of four books, three main parts, and a supplement. The Monster Manual and Gods, Demigods, and Heroes will fit into the original game system with a bit of care on the part of the Dungeon Master, if such is desired. But all in all, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons is a new game. Upon its release, this new supplement was of great interest to Dungeons & Dragons players at the time. I remember quite fondly enjoying looking at the AD&D game statistics for such heroes as King Arthur, Sir Lancelot, and the other Knights of the Round Table. Looking at what spells Morgan Le Fay and Merlin knew. What level magic user was Merlin anyway? Now you could look such things up. But also of interest was how a dungeon master was to adjudicate running these massively powerful divine beings and how a cleric might integrate the worship of their deity more cleanly into their character background. The book's authors, Jim Ward and Rob Kuntz, do a great job with this. First, there are charts of ability scores above 18, which I believe was the first time ability scores that high had ever been officially released. Then some standard divine abilities that all deities share, such as the ability to gate and teleport to anywhere on any plane without error, and other logical things such as true seeing, comprehend languages, and so on. Then in the next section, they go into great pains to discuss how a dungeon master might adjudicate these divine beings of power. There's a bit of a bad rap this book has, where many DMs simply ran the gods as additional monsters for their player characters to face. But such use of these divine beings is not encouraged here, 
And I attribute such nonsense to poor DMing or simply people just having a bit of fun at the game table. But I'm sure we've all met that guy who would passionately insist that his character slew Zeus on Mount Olympus and retired as the new head of the Greek pantheon or other such nonsense. In the clerics and deities section, the various powers are further defined into different categories, demigods, lesser gods, and greater gods. This has a gameplay effect as to what spells a deity can bestow upon their followers. Thus, first and second level spells are actually gained through a cleric's direct knowledge and faith. Third through fifth level spells are granted by the deity's servants or supernatural minions. A note of importance here is that demigods cannot grant spells above 5th level. 6th and 7th level spells are granted to a cleric by their god directly. Also discussed is what happens when a cleric strays from the path, so to speak, and commits a transgression. What spells are lost and how a cleric can repent after such. What about omens and portents or good luck? What about the appearance of a rainbow or the bowling of mistletoe and combining it with spring water? Well, the omen section discusses all of this. There is the mortality and immortality section, which discusses the spirit versus the soul. This is important to know for such spells as resurrection versus a raised dead spell. After death, what happens to said spirit or soul? Thus provided is a known planes of existence section and based upon alignment and the character's behavior, a DM can determine the character's final outcome and final place of rest once they pass on to the afterlife. Of another excellent supplement and fun section is that of Divine Ascension. How might a character become not just a legend in the campaign setting, but actually ascend to godhood themselves? Well, Ward goes over that in great detail, and it's important to note it does not include slaying a deity on their home plane of existence. Honestly, I just love this stuff, and it makes for great fodder for those discussions after a game, or when you're just sitting around with some of your friends talking Dungeons & Dragons stuff. In my opinion, it's the second level of immersion, thinking, and detail that elevates 1st edition Advanced Dungeons & Dragons into a more esoteric place with these heady, semi-intellectual talking points that supersede just playing the game. The nice thing about this section of the rules is that you could totally integrate it into any future editions of the game if you are so inclined. This is really top-notch fluff, and it's for these reasons that I think a lot of players are very loyal to this edition. Combined with the Dungeon Master's Guide, there's a massive accumulation of lore just for the game itself. So, let's go into the alleged controversy surrounding the inclusion of the Cthulhu, Mandabone, and Nuan mythos in this supplement. The bottom line here is that there isn't one, other than the self-made controversy that came about due to TSR's management, or should I say mismanagement, of its own properties. I'd like to put forth my own opinion here, if I may, in that at this time, role-playing games were still in their gangly pre-adolescent stage. Publishing companies and authors didn't quite know what to make of the gaming hobby as a whole, much less role-playing games, and how to deal with the licensing of their intellectual properties and what exactly it meant to describe them in game terms. As DM David writes in his blog, no one outside the hobby considered existential horror tales from the 1920s a suitable topic for a game. Request to use Cthulhu for a game of all things probably puzzled the administrative staff at Arkham. As this story keeps showing, few outside of gaming saw game rights to fiction as anything of value. I'd also like to mention that Seth Skorkowski did a fantastic job breaking all of this down in his own video on the Deities and Demigods supplement. He even had Call of Cthulhu co-author Sandy Peterson provide a very detailed recounting of what happened between Chaosium and TSR, so you might want to check it out. And of course, I've left links for that video in this video's description. In addition, there's DM David's blog, which also lays out the events quite well. Further, Jim Ward has also posted about this, so I'll do my due diligence here and try to bring all of this together as best I can.
Essentially, Jim Ward contacted the various authors and publishing companies directly and in turn received permission to use the Cthulhu, Mandabone, and Nuon myths in Deities and Demigods. The problem is that in each case, Chaosium had already received like permissions. In the case of the Melnabone myths, Chaosium had already acquired the rights for the 1977 Elric Battle to the End of Time board game. The release of the Call of Cthulhu game was slated for a 1981 release, and Chaosium had planned to release a Stormbringer RPG that same year. Thus, after Deities and Demigods release, Chaosium sent TSR a cease and desist letter. Brian Bloom didn't want to go to court, going to California, getting a lawyer, was an expense that TSR couldn't afford at that time. As it turned out, both companies had something to offer. Thus, an accommodation was sought, and the result was TSR could continue to publish Deities and Demigods as is, with a simple special thanks notice to Chaosium in its second printing, which you can see here. And in exchange, Chaosium got to use the AD&D and D&D stats in their upcoming release of Robert Aspirin's very excellent Thieves' World supplement, which, by the way, I did a very extensive review a few years ago, and you can check it out here. Anyway, boom, problem solved, right? Everyone's happy, move on. What happened next, in my opinion, is just indicative of the state of poor management of TSR at the time. For the third printing of the supplement, Brian Bloom elected to remove the Cthulhu and Malnabone sections of the book and just run with fewer pages. Author Shannon Applecline, writer of the historical books on role-playing games, Designers and Dragons, suggests Bloom sought to soothe the satanic panic crowd. This would in turn lead to the renaming of the book to Legends and Lore a few years later, a bowing to which that did not sit well with Gary Gygax. In his Sorcerer's Scroll article, The Future of the Game, in Dragon Magazine 103, where he was talking about the AD&D game's new revisions, he wrote, Now the Deities and Demigods Cyclopedia, recently retitled Legends and Lore, by others as a sop, or bowing to pressure from those who don't buy our products anyway. For those candid enthusiasts who do not read between the lines, as they say, I do not particularly approve of the retitling of the work. More likely, it seems, Bloom did not want to mention the competition in a TSR book, which might fuel interest in such and lead customers to a competitor's games. Silly, I know, a rising tide lifts all boats. The side effect of the removal of these pantheons was the beginning of rumors among players that Chaosium sued TSR, that Jim Ward plagiarized the Cthulhu and Malnabone myths, and so on. Rumors that never would have happened had Bloom just left them in place. Now, if you're trying to figure out what printing you have, it's actually pretty easy. The collector's site, the Aseum, breaks it down pretty well. The first printing has the Cthulhu and Malnabone myths included, but no Chaosium, thank you. The second printing still has both myths, and now there's the Chaosium, thank you, on the inside cover page. The third printing removes the Cthulhu and Malnabone myths completely, keeps the Chaosium thank you, and most interestingly still states on the back cover that there are 17 pantheons included, even though the page count had been reduced from 144 pages to 129 pages. From the fourth printing one, the Chaosium thank you is removed, and the back cover correctly states there are 15 pantheons covered. Despite rumors to the contrary, the Nuon mythos was never removed from the book, and the story behind that, in my opinion, is truly an appalling look into the state of TSR management philosophy at the time. Fritz Leiber had actually stayed at Gary Gygax's house for a week in 1977, and Gygax considered him a friend. Thus, Jim Ward was able to contact Leiber and secure authorization to use his Nuon mythos relatively easy. Gary gave him Leiber's phone number. However, Leiber had previously given such rights over to Chaosium years earlier. Leiber was a terminal alcoholic by this time, and Chaosium founder Greg Stafford had thought to help out someone whose work had brought him much joy. When Stafford contacted TSR, pointing out that they had the better claim, Brian Bloom suggested that Chaosium could just sue Leiber. To his credit, this horrified Stafford, 
Piper was one of his literary heroes. And given the state of the man's health, he had no desire to wreak further havoc on the man's life and simply just dropped it. Despite the fact that Chaosium had planned to release a City of Lankmore supplement in 1983. In 1985, TSR released their own Lankmore supplement, Lankmore City of Adventure. So while there was never any plagiarism on Jim Ward's part, there was a certain level of needless nastiness and ineptness on the part of TSR management, in my opinion. Brian Bloom's attitude towards Fritz Leiber and the failure of TSR to correctly annotate the changes to the book for potential buyers is unprofessional. It should also be noted that Jim Ward offered to replace the missing mythos, but was rebuffed by Bloom, who apparently was more than happy to just sell the book at the same price at a reduced cost due to the fewer pages. So, with all of that said, despite TSR management being complete jerks, James Ward and Rob Koontz did a phenomenal job with this book, and Deities and Demigods is still a good resource, in my opinion. Especially if you are a fan of Dungeons & Dragons cosmology, which I am, and I guess I was an impressionable 14-year-old because D&D's known planes of existence have always fascinated me, and the appendices for Deities and Demigods take the most detailed look at such since the release of the first edition player's handbook. I've also found planar travel to be one of the more intriguing aspects of the game, and here we get a more detailed look at how to travel between the various planes and what combat is like in the ethereal and astral planes, something that would later be given more detail in the manual of the plane supplement, but that didn't come out till 1985. So, very handy indeed is Appendix 3, Clerical Quick Reference Charts, here you can, at a glance, see what exactly a deity is in charge of, their sphere of control, what animals are associated or sacred to said deity, are there limitations on who can serve the god, such as a, only males or only females or only non-human deities, what do practitioners of the faith wear, and what are their colors, and what holy days do they observe? Very important questions for any cleric player or DM, and it's nicely broken down into a quick reference chart form. I would also be remiss if I didn't mention the very excellent and fascinating non-human deities section. What gods do bugbears, lizardmen, and orcs worship? What about elves, dwarves, and halflings? Well, you'll find those answers here and more. Surely you know that Loth the Spider Queen is a lesser god, but did you know that so too is Orcus, Demogorgon, and Jublex? Here you'll find the first mention of the elven deities and the greater gods, and other deities included are those of the giants, kobolds, and ogres, plus others mentioned in previous DSR adventure modules, such as Loth the Spider Queen, and from Queen of the Demonweb Pits, and Blib the Pulup from Shrine of the Kawatoa. There is so much classic Dungeons & Dragons lore compiled into a single volume, and to me, that makes it endlessly fascinating. Much of my own personal love of the game is rooted in what's presented within these pages. Fortunately, you can purchase the PDFs for both 1st edition AD&D, 4th printing Deities and Demigods, and Legends and Lore, if you're so inclined, very inexpensively from Drive-Thru RPG. I provide a link for both in the description. They are both on sale for less than $4 right now. Unfortunately, they are not yet available for print on demand. I have both of these scans and they are excellently reconstituted, annotated, and searchable. As a side note, if you'd like to get a look at the historic first print of Deities and Demigods, you still can at the Internet Archive, where you can peruse the book online or, yes, download the PDF. I'll provide a link for that, too, in the description. Thank you all so much for watching. This video isn't so much a review as it is an historical look back, so there's no D20 rating. I've got quite a few requests in the comments lately for more Dungeons and & Crawl Classics content, so next week I've got that for you with a look at a fantasy horror adventure called It Consumes. I'd like to take a moment to thank my Patreons for their support. Without them, this channel is just not possible. Please help me out with a like, comment, and share. Subscribe and click the little bell so you get notifications when I upload new content. Please check out the Teespring store, the old school shop, for some fun, fascinating gaming swag, t-shirts, carry bags, coffee mugs, and more. Consider supporting me on Patreon. And if you feel inclined, 
send a tip. You can do so through my PayPal tip jar or super thanks right here. A link for everything is in the description. And as always, my friends, may your D20 roll true and game on.